And joining us now on the line from Princeton, New Jersey, Professor Julian Zelizer. He is a professor of history and public affairs at Princeton University. And Professor Zelizer, we're glad you could spare some time for us on TVO tonight. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me. Not at all. Let me start by reading something that Maureen Dowd, the occasionally humorous a columnist in the New York Times wrote about President Obama's management style before he was the president. This is when he was only campaigning for office about a year and a half ago. Here's what she said. Hillary Clinton was so busy trying to prove she could be one of the boys that she only belatedly realized that many Democratic and independent voters were eager to move from hard power locker room tactics to a soft power sewing circle approach. Less towel snapping and more towel color coordinating less steroids, and more sensitivity. After so many years when W. and Cheney stomped on the world and the world glared back, many Americans would like to see their government focus more on those staples of female fiction, relationships, and conversation. Well, this is a good way, I think, to kick off a, a conversation you and I are going to have about President Obama's management style. And when you think of him now as Commander-in-Chief, do you, in fact, think more of soft power, less towel snapping, and more sensitivity? I think the term soft power is a bit helpful to understand how he's operated. Certainly with Congress, he has not tried to just push through his ideas in the way that we saw with the Bush administration. He has really given Congress room uh, to try to write its own bills and shape its own ideas, and it's try he's tried to influence in many ways what they come up with. And, and the same with the public, both here and overseas. He's not been very heavy-handed in how he deals with the various publics. Uh, I think he's trying persuasion. I, I think he gives people room to make their own decisions, even while making his positions very clear. Uh, and it's a big contrast from the kind of politics that we saw in the previous eight years. Yeah, amplify on that a little bit, if you would. If he's not a kind of a top-down, here's how it's going to be type of leader, uh, what kind of leader would you describe him as? Well, the thing is, he is and he isn't. I mean, he does state his positions very clear. He states what he wants. He states what his preferences are. Uh, but then he gives other people time to reach what his objectives are or to offer compromises along the way. So uh, one of the first bills he put forward, this economic stim stimulus plan, really weeks after he started his presidency. Uh, and he asked, in the end, for a lot more than he wanted, in part because centrist members of the Democratic Party were insisting they would not spend as much as he wanted. And in the final version of the bill, he compromised and angered many of his supporters by agreeing to even further cuts in the stimulus program. So on that one bill, we initially saw a president who was not going to force through what he wanted. More dramatic has been the health care plan. He's told Congress what he wants, but thus far, the details, the details of the bill uh, have been in the hands of Congress. And, and most of the debate thus far has not taken place from the White House. It's been on Capitol Hill. Hmm. We know he is one of the great speakers of this or any other generation, but that shouldn't obscure the fact that listening is also an important trait for politicians to have, particularly presidents. On a continuum where some presidents listen to everybody and and are therefore you know, hamstrung in a way from making decisions because they're always trying to get one more opinion, to the other end of the continuum where a president never listens, is a bull in a china shop, does whatever he wants, and moves forward, where do you put President Obama? I think he's in the middle. I mean, I clearly think this is not a president who's simply moving forward with everything that he wants to do. Uh, and he's not someone who simply responds to pressure. There's been two main sources of pressure. You know, one, one source of pressure has been the liberal base of the Democratic Party, which has demanded things that are more ambitious than often the White House feels are realistic. Uh, and the president has heard their complaints. But again, with the economic stimulus bill and with other legislation, he's been willing to say no to them after hearing and listening to what they say. Uh, also, recently with Iran, many conservative Republicans have been insisting publicly to do something tougher, uh, to take a tougher stand in favor of the reformers, in favor of the protesters. And thus far, the president hasn't buckled. Uh, I do think he's heard what the message is, the concerns with not doing enough at this moment in history to promote democracy, but he has not bowed down to that kind of pressure. Uh, so I think he's in the middle of the spectrum thus far. Hmm. Uh, they say if you're a politician and you've got 10 or 15 priorities, you really don't have any priorities at all. And as you look at how the president is trying to manage what's on his plate right now, 
uh, two wars, bailing out auto companies and a co you know bailing out the financial system, trying to put an energy package together, trying to re you know uh, completely revamp the healthcare system in the United States. Would you say that his governing style, in fact, does reflect just a few priorities and therefore priorities at all, or does it appear to be all over the place? Well, I think, you know, he wants to avoid the Jimmy Carter model, where President Carter in the 1970s proposed many things all at once and almost overwhelmed Congress, who felt like this was stuff they couldn't handle, and, and, and the White House was almost being arrogant in how it treated the legislative branch. And so I do think he's more disciplined in what his top priorities are, namely health care. I, I think first was the economic stimulus, now it's health care. And, and he's put things aside. I mean, environmental regulation has not been front and center. I think he's willing to postpone that. NAFTA reform, which was something that came up in the campaign, has not been very central early on. It's health care. That's what he wants right now, and that's where he's placing most of his bets. Uh, but at the same time, this is a president that can't make all the decisions about what people are going to focus on. As you said, it's a time of two wars and economic crisis. So he's navigating those two things. He's dealing with many issues. But at the same time, in terms of what his priority is, I think he is narrowing down to health care. And he's saying to Congress, this is the major thing I want. Let's get this done by October. And let me follow up on the national security angle. You know, there was a great debate, uh, mostly in the left wing of the Democratic Party, on whether to release those so-called torture memos and other pictures of other abuses that may have taken place over the years uh, as it relates to the war in Iraq or the war in Afghanistan. He did, in fact, release those torture memos, and there was ensuing tension between the President, his administration, and the CIA. What did all of that, in your view, uh, teach us about his governing style? Well, I, I mean, I think it taught us two things. In terms of its, his style, I do think he's a pragmatist. I, I think, you know, people who present President Obama as somehow blindly loyal to the left wing of the Democratic Party have him wrong. Uh, I think he understands which way the political winds are blowing, what's possible and what's dangerous, both politically and strategically. And, and he's made a series of decisions in terms of national security. Uh, when he was in the Senate in the middle of campaign, he voted to kind of continue the national surveillance program that had been so controversial. Uh, with Guantanamo, he's made a series of reversals. And with the interrogation photographs, he said to many Democrats in his party, I won't release him. And, and that suggests a kind of uh, Rooseveltian style in terms of Franklin Roosevelt, our president during the Great Depression. He's willing to kind of find the areas of compromise that are necessary. He does not want to bog down his entire presidency, his entire administration, on one or two controversial issues uh, that he, he doesn't think are necessary to resolve at this point. Uh, but it opens up room for critics to say, you know, this is a person who will shift. Uh, he can be Clintonian, so to speak, hmm. and he doesn't have core principles in this area of, po of politics. I, I don't think that's true. I, I, I just think we're seeing someone who's very pragmatic try to navigate those waters right now. Okay, let me follow up with this. They, they say the conventional wisdom is that most presidents have about a year, a year and a half, when their currency is really at its best, and that's the time when you can spend it. After a year and a half, you know, you're, you're already campaigning for the midterm elections and you're going through what potentially is a, you know, a, a traditional lull in your first term and so on. How has Obama's managing style been affected knowing that that currency is really at its best in the first year, year and a half, and how's he reacted to that? I think, you know, he responds to the political cycle well. I, th I think we've seen a very dramatic effort uh, again, to push through with his big initiative early in this administration. There was a lot of pressure to say, let's wait on health care reform because we're dealing with this economic crisis. Uh, but the president, in terms of deciding what his political policy schedule should be, has insisted that health care come now, not later. And, and I think that's his uh, kind of political sensitivity. It's not just the midterm elections. It's this 24-hour instant media cycle in which he governs, uh, where he realizes that in some ways the honeymoon has been over since he started. Uh, but that will only become uh, amplified with the midterm election. So I think the way he's handling health care uh, is indicative of his sensitivity to that political cycle. He's also agreed to use something, a technical term called the reconciliation process, 
which is part of the budget process here in the United States. And it means that in October, if Congress wants, they could include health care under uh, a budget process that prohibits the filibuster, when senators can endlessly speak against legislation. And, and that's a pretty bold move if the president does it. And again, I think the reason he's doing it is exactly what you're saying. He realizes by next year, members of Congress are going to be thinking about 2010, not 2008. And it's going to be a lot harder to get this signature bill through. Okay. Let's look at the team behind the president. And I, obviously, given the times in which he finds himself governing, uh, the economy in an unprecedented way has become an issue. Um, well, for anybody who's, I guess, over 80, they'll remember the Great Depression. But since then, this is the biggest thing we've ever had to deal with. And as a result, he has not only the sort of traditional institutional uh, team of advisors in his cabinet and so on and in the White House, but he's also got this extra layer, this Economic Recovery Advisory Board. What did the assembling of that team tell us about how he wants to manage through this crisis? Well, I think, uh, you know, he has put together a team of economic uh, advisors from Paul Volcker, the former uh, chair of the Federal Reserve, who is the head of this kind of advisory group, to people like Larry Summers, who is the head of his economic team in the White House, essentially responsible for coordinating all the economic advice he gets. He's drawn on a team of advisor that comes out of the 1980s and 1990s style of thinking about the economy. This is not a, a group of economists who are influenced by the great society in the 1960s. They're influenced by the era of Reagan and the era of Bill Clinton. Uh, they're very uh, much believers in the free market. They want to ultimately limit the kinds of regulations we have, even though now they're willing to use government aggressively. Uh, and I think his selection of these people reflected not just a desire for people with experience, uh, but a desire for people who come from that mindset. Uh, and, and the advisors you select reflect, I think, the policies you want to achieve. And so those, those particular advisors, I think, were very indicative uh, of the kind of economics he wants to pursue, and he did with the financial bailout. Uh, in many ways, he was restrained in terms of uh, limiting executive compensation. Uh, and, and much of the program has been about giving money to revitalize uh, you know, freestanding financial institutions. And if you look beyond that team of economic advisors and go a little more broadly, uh, you find people like Hillary Clinton as well. And I think one of, the, one of the questions we need a better understanding of is how has he managed to balance all of those you know, and I don't say this in a bad way, you've got to have some of this if you're in public life, but you know, no one's ever accused Larry Summers of being a shrinking violet. How does he manage all these massive egos in that cabinet, among his team of economic advisors, more broadly on his personal staff, and so on? Yeah, I, I mean, there's two characteristics of the, the advisors, the cabinet. One is, it's a, some say, a team of egos. Uh, these are very prominent people, people who have their own ideas, and people who are not going to buckle to the president. Uh, the second is it's a team with a lot of political experience. That is, I think, the defining characteristic of his cabinet. These are people who know how to work on Capitol Hill. These are people who know how to work the public. And I think he brought that in. Uh, in terms of the first part, which you talked about, you know, these are, are people with big egos. It's a lot like what John F. Kennedy faced. What we've heard so far is, again, he gives them room uh, to give their opinions. He is not someone who's constantly in their face uh, telling them, I want A, B, and C. He gives the advisors some room to come to him uh, with policies. And I think this is functional for him uh, because they feel like they can exercise their skills uh, and they can exhibit that aspect of their personality. But at the same time, he's an extraordinarily smart president. So in these private meetings, all accounts say he can handle them one-on-one. -on -one. It's different, some say, than President Bush, who was overwhelmed by a team of advisors who was so prominent. This is a president who could shoot back, uh, again, much like John F. Kennedy. He could hear from the best and the brightest. He can allow them to have their say. But then he steps in on issues like the economy or Iran and has a very definitive response and sense about where he wants to take the policy. That having been said, though, it feels as if he's going even further than just allowing them to have their say, as it were. He seems to be a real delegator of responsibility. I've read stories where people have tried to brief him, and he's interrupted them, saying, look, you don't have to tell me every chapter and verse. I trust you to get this right. Just go off and do it. Can you tell whether or not that approach seems to be paying dividends so far? 
Well, you know, we'll have to see. Again, I think a lot of these measures are difficult because we're only a few months into his presidency, so we don't know how the economy will be a year from now. If it's doing very badly, uh, some of that delegation m might not uh, look so good. Uh, you know, if the economic stimulus plan as it was crafted turns out to be sloppy or misconceived in areas he wasn't really paying attention to, that's when that kind of presidential delegation looks bad. Uh, but thus far, I think, you know, given the polls and his popularity, given the stabilization of markets that we've seen, uh, I think his, you know, ability to pick a team that was very strong and then delegate to them when necessary has been effective. I think he's going into his second half of the year in a pretty strong position. So you'd have to say that style is working uh, relatively well. And again, it, it's important he has such a strong public presence. Uh, this is not someone people accuse of being ignorant or not being able to understand the policy issues at hand. So I think that gives him a little political capital, so to speak, to delegate a bit. Uh, and the public doesn't start to perceive a president who's not on top of the situation. Hmm. Well, again, in contrast to his predecessor, who we're told was an early to bed, early to rise kind of president, uh, liked his presidential briefings very early in the morning, uh, never watched David Letterman once, I think, during the whole time of his presidency, because that was well past bedtime. This guy apparently uh, comes to the Oval Office at 9 o'clock in the morning, because he likes his morning workouts. He apparently uh, sends emails out, not every night, but every now and then at 1.30 in the morning. It's not unusual to get an email from the Commander-in-Chief. Do you think it's a good idea for the President to be working those kinds of hours? Well, there could be a danger to it. I mean, the, 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 the good side is you have a President who's you know, clearly working to be on top of all the issues, who's facing these massive multiple challenges and, and is not shying away from them. And I think some Americans find it refreshing in contrast to the previous work style. We just want to see a president in a time of crisis who is constantly working, who's constantly thinking, uh, and, and who's constantly monitoring what's going on uh, in Washington and abroad. On the other hand, you know, again, the memory of Jimmy Carter, who was very much like that. He worked constantly all the time, very smart, extraordinarily smart president, one of the smartest we've had. In the end, that became a liability. There was a sense that he was so overwhelmed by the work uh, and, and so overwhelmed by the detail, uh, so to speak, that he lost his leadership ability. He was worn down. He was tired. He couldn't pick which were the issues to focus on and which were the ones to leave to others. Uh, thus far, Obama hasn't done that, but I think that is something very much on the uh, mind of his team, uh, that he doesn't want to have a presidency where he's almost trapped in the White House, uh, you know, and, and then giving a sense that he's, in fact, not a very capable leader. Okay, Julian, our last minute here, I want to do one more contrast with the Bush administration. It was, it was famously reported that if you had business to do in the Oval Office, jacket and tie were an absolute must, even on the weekends. And you never, ever, ever saw President Bush in that Oval Office without being, quote, unquote, appropriately attired. I think on the first or second day of his presidency, President Obama was photographed, sleeves up, tie undone, and a top button uh, undone as well. Uh, the White House is also, quote, unquote, business casual on the weekends. Do you think Americans find this disrespectful? I don't think there's any sense of that yet. Uh, I'm sure there are some Americans who don't like that, and, and some of his opponents might even use that uh, as, as some kind of uh, you know, uh, image against him. Uh, but in general, I, I mean, I think, A, a lot of Americans are familiar with that style. That is the style of much of the American workplace in the, in the Internet computer age, in the Microsoft age, in the Apple age, where we're familiar uh, that the workplace isn't always uh, as formal as it used to be. And so uh, I think some are fine uh, seeing a president do that. And, and there's also political value. I mean, the image of someone you know, with his sleeves rolled up without the tie on is a quintessential American image of someone really delving into their work. Uh, and, and part of the 2008 election was a thirst not just for change, but for a president who would do just that. Uh, and that's a form of leadership that I think could prove enormously popular. And I think that image that you mentioned can capture that for many Americans. It's not always the person uh, in a tie and jacket who symbolizes to Americans the person who's working hardest. It's often that person with their sleeves rolled up, looking a little disheveled, uh, but sitting in a mound of paper with advisors all around them. Uh, that can become a very potent image uh, of someone who is trying to resolve and respond 
and, and move beyond the crises this country has faced in the past few months. Julian, that's clearly the case tonight for you and me because I am in my suit and tie and you are elegantly attired in an open neck shirt with no tie and it seems to work perfectly for you. So thank you very much for joining us on the line from Princeton. Thank you.